Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever you're listening. This is Davisville on KDRT LP 95.7 FM in Davis, California. We live at kdrt.org online. I'm Bill Buchanan, and I thank you for tuning in. Well, today's guest first appeared on Davisville a year ago to talk about homelessness in Davis. And among other things, we heard at the time that although many homeless people in town were finding homes, a greater number of people were becoming homeless. I thought it was a really useful and interesting half hour, and so I am glad to welcome back today Ryan Collins and Paul Doroshoff for a follow-up talk. Ryan is the Homeless Outreach Services Coordinator for the City of Davis and works directly with the homeless. Paul is Deputy Police Chief for Davis, and in his more than 30 years on the Davis Force, has seen a lot of change in how the city responds to the problem. I should add a note at the top of the show, we're recording this by Zoom. They're both on Zoom, so you're gonna get some of the usual Zoomisms. We might talk over each other here and there, but I think the gist of the conversation will come through. And also Paul has told me he might have to leave a little before the interview is done to get on to um, another meeting he has to get to today. But anyway, with all that said, Ryan and Paul, thank you very much uh, for appearing on the show today. Of course. Thank you, Bill. So. Um, when we talked in uh, July 2019, uh, the number of homeless people in Davis was rising. That's the net number. What's the trend this year? I think I can speak to that. Um, so the trend that we have seen this year is for that number to at least be steady or growing. Um, we definitely haven't had a net reduction in people living in homelessness in the city. And that's a trend that we are continuing to see um, kind of regionally, statewide, and nationally. Uh, we don't have an updated um, unsheltered point in time count census at this time, but that um, is going to be done at the end of January. So we should have some fresh data for you then. But just looking at the um, broader drivers of homelessness, we're in sort of the midst of an economic downturn. Uh, housing prices still remain high. We are seeing uh, just the, the sort of rental and housing markets being shaken up by, by COVID. And we are seeing a lot of people, even in places where there are eviction pre prevention sort of or protections enacted by uh, local government, that um, for anybody who has an informal kind of living situation where they might be on someone's couch and they're just subleasing or, um, you know, they're, they're staying with family or whatever. A lot of those folks are uh, now onto the streets because either they couldn't pay when they lost their employment opportunities or their unemployment extra funds ran out or they had something under the table to begin with or sometimes they're forced out because they're staying with like an elderly family member where that person is now at risk from COVID and they, they can't just be cohabiting the same one bedroom. So it's shifting around the margins a lot with the overall trend towards growth. Bill, and just one thing too, I think there's, I don't know how, uh, when it'll be realized, but there, again, there's this fear that when these um, eviction moratoriums wear out and unless there's a solution for the problem that, you know, you're going to have another uh, rash of evictions due to the fact that, you know, simply a lot of people can't pay the rent now and won't be able to pay multiple months of rent that's been compiled. Yeah, in fact, we, um, for those who don't know, the first speaker you heard was Ryan, and then it was Paul speaking most recently. Um, Ryan Collins, the homeless coordinator, uh, and uh, Paul Dorshop, deputy police chief. So there's a lot in those answers. So the growth is, it, it's up, but maybe not like it was. Uh, do I understand that correctly? We are seeing growth. I mean, we're seeing new faces show up. Um, we're, we're seeing providers sort of reaching out um, for assistance on more difficult cases where they haven't necessarily encountered the person before, but um, someone who was, you know, vulnerable is now experiencing homelessness. We don't have census data. We, we take something called a point in time or pit count um, that's mandated <laughs> by HUD, uh, to be done every two years. That will be done in January, um, but in terms of like calls for service related to homelessness or referrals from provider or what I'm hearing from the local continuum of care, we are having an increased demand for services. Um, probably a lot of it is pandemic related. Yeah, well, and I guess that was the, uh, the larger part of your answer really, and there was a lot there uh, talking about a lot of the different causes for homelessness, which the economy is certainly one. I know we've talked in the past that uh, mental health uh, can be an issue, uh, drugs or such can be an issue. And then on top of it now, we have the pandemic. And uh, that was one of the main things I wanted to, to ask about today is 
how has the pandemic affected what you're doing? And that's a broad question, I realize, but I'd be interested in however you, you want to answer that. Maybe Ryan, start with you, and then Paul, I'd be interested in what you see as, as a, a police officer. I, I think that now every service provider that works with people living in homelessness is now, in effect, kind of a, a healthcare provider in some regard, because they're all having to do some work with screening to, to make sure that if they're serving someone in their day shelter or their overnight shelter or their outreach program or whatever, they're having to take additional precautions to turn some people away and to try to sort of route them to appropriate levels of care. Like let's say um, someone shows up at your door, you do a, an infrared thermometer scan, they're showing a fever, you, you ask some questions, you realize this person needs to be in a hospital and then you know figure out how to, to do that. That's kind of a, a whole set of protocols that they haven't had to deal with before. And then when the, the system sort of has the alert that there is a more medically vulnerable person now living in homelessness, due to concerns with the pandemic, especially for people that have um, pre-existing health conditions or are older adults, we're trying to make sure that those people have some additional options for getting shelter that they didn't before. So um, all the local jurisdictions, Davis included, are working um, with County Health and Human Services on a program called Project Room Key that's trying to get older adults and medically vulnerable people temporarily sheltered in hotels and motels locally. They've master leased blocks of rooms at a number of sites. And it's uh, unlike general emergency shelter, which is kind of first come, first served, you know, someone will show up and say, hey, please give me a safe place to stay tonight. This is definitely something that's operating on more of a triage model of we would like to get everyone inside, but because we do not have unlimited hotel rooms or unlimited funding, um, we're having to make uh, decisions more akin to what like a, a hospital might do and saying who gets served first based on greatest need. Project Room Key, in fact, this is maybe a, a place to mention it. I was looking at the county's Health and Human Services Agency was able to serve about 390 homeless individuals and house an average of 202 individuals per night, I think, as part of that. I was reading that in the uh, Woodland newspaper, which sounded useful. Paul, how how's it look to you? Yeah, speaking of subject room key, I mean, uh, our project room key, I'm sorry. I, we, you know, we, we have had some more managing demands, demands uh, in regard to that, because obviously you're placing a lot of people in a closed area, kind of a close proximity area, some of those folks are going to have the dysfunctions as far as substance abuse and things like that. So, so that did, it's manageable and I think it's been a success so far, but, um, but it does take a little bit of uh, resource to do that from a law enforcement perspective. Well, as I say, so, Project, Project Home Key, when I, when, as I've read about the pandemic and how it's affected things, it struck me that Home Key, and I understand there's a follow-up program, I'm sorry, Room Key at first, Home Key, I guess, is the follow-up program, right? To, and I forget permanent housing for the people. That sounded like something new, uh, something that honestly maybe wouldn't have happened if not for the pandemic. Uh, is that true? Is, is this a case where the pandemic sort of spurred a kind of action that maybe wouldn't have been possible before? Could have. Uh, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Could it have designed a, forced us to design a better model for this type of care? That's possible. Like I said, we'll have to see the longevity of that after the, you know, things kind of go back to normal, assuming they ever do. <laughs> but, but that's a possibility. And a lot of times, you know, these types of situations do force a design that's more efficient to deal with a problem. Ryan, I imagine, you know, you work directly with the homeless, right? You've, and you've done this for about three years for the city. That's and correct. So, so you talk with homeless people, I imagine, every day. You were talking about triage a minute ago, trying to find folks who who really do need shelter, a lot of this must rely on the contacts and the conversations and the connections that you make with, with homeless in Davis. It does. Whether um, myself or um, Sandy on my team are reached out to directly by a person on the street or whether we get a, a referral like from a patrol officer that sees someone in need or um, whether we are uh, talking uh, with a, a local homeless services provider who um, reaches out to us, we, we are using those conversations as starting points to do needs assessment that 
are influenced by that pandemic. So we're, we're looking at medical risk factors and taking more referrals from people, for example, exiting the hospital system. It, it is uh, intertwined with all of the, the sort of pandemic in terms of figuring out what someone needs in this moment. Part of our uh, kind of decision tree is definitely how is the, the pandemic going to affect this person individually and do we have some additional resources to maybe help meet that need um, that wouldn't otherwise be uh, available outside of kind of the present uh, crisis? Are you hearing when you talk to homeless individuals, are you hearing any different uh, stories from them this year, say compared to other years? I'm sure every individual has a somewhat different story at least, but I'm curious what they're telling you about directly how the pandemic has affected them? Uh, I, I think that, well, I'll, I'll go through a few anecdotes. So there was a, a person that we were serving in Project Room Key that used to make an income hand handling. But then when uh, shelter in place orders came down, you know, that person is no longer able to rely on that as a form of income. They do have some medical conditions, but just navigating the process of uh, getting on social security disability can be a challenge, especially for someone with diminished capacity. Um, but the pandemic pretty much left them without that income that they had come to rely on. They had to reach out to the system for some support. And you know now that person is working with a medical provider to kind of get documentation together that they need in order to make the, the case so that they can have and income through social security. And then just the other day uh, on Friday, I think I was off duty, but I was in town and I, I saw an older looking person kind of on, on the sidewalk near um, Mason Cowell. Um, and he didn't look like he was doing too great. So I, I logged on for a minute and I, I went up and I approached him and you know I, I just wanted to get a little information, gave him some water and some outreach supplies you know, said, hey, can we talk about your health? You know, we're concerned about the pandemic. We might have some additional service offerings available to you uh, that wouldn't be there already. And um, in the course of the conversation, I mean, it became clear to me that this person had like a, a psychiatric condition that wasn't being treated. And he said, I, I think that the, the virus is made up. He said, I, I think that they're, uh, you know, if someone gets hit by a car or a bus or whatever, they, they just uh, lump it in, they call it due to the virus. And that you know, it's uh, something that's being used to get funding. And I mean, I had to kind of nod along, you know, politely challenge, not burn rapport, use it as something where I said, okay, I'm gonna try to check on you next week, it's all right, and, and just move again. But um, for some people that are maybe the most vulnerable, like that person, they know that there's something different going on with the virus, but they're, they're not really able to comprehend all of the changes that the pandemic has kind of made to society or how that's gonna um, shake out for them personally. So we, we're trying to help everybody we can, especially the people that are more vulnerable. And, and some people are, are sort of more aware or cognizant of how life has changed and how that affects them personally than others. Paul, one thing you said last year that struck me as, as significant particularly was when you said that one of the ways that police uh, enforcement of let's call it the dysfunctional aspects of homelessness has changed over the years was that the uh, a lot of it now is trying to steer people towards services. You come across someone who's doing something that has required a police response. And now, maybe compared to years earlier, uh, you're trying more to get them to, well, I suppose to people like Ryan and to the services that he connects. Do I recall that correctly? And, and if that's the case, I imagine that's maybe more true this year? Yeah, I think it's becoming uh, truer and truer. And, and it's interesting discussion because you know, when you look at some of the concepts behind the defund the police movement is to separate the police from and, and invest more in social work, which there is some uh, value to that. However, I think what I'm hoping for and what works really smooth, I think, on, on a workable level is this integrated system where essentially police officers a lot of times receive the call because of a behavior in, in the community that's concerning. and recognizing that the root of the problem is the homeless issues and maybe mental health or something else. They have the seamless uh, capability to integrate with social workers, people like Ryan, and, and, and kind of hand the problem off for a longer term solution. 
And I, I, I truly think that's the future because, I mean, there's no way to arrest your way out of these problems. And really, these are, these are more um, social ills than they are uh, from problems of criminality. Yeah, we should mention, Ryan, uh, you're actually part of the police department, correct? Correct. And, so, and uh, you referred to Sandy. I, I don't, and I, is Sandy the person, because uh, a year ago, you, the city was going to hire a second position to sort of do what you do to sort of increase the effectiveness of uh, the, the capacity. That's uh, correct. Yeah, so I'm, um, I'm an unsworn supervisor. I, I did not go to the police academy, but I am part of the police command structure. I report up um, to our deputy director of police services, um, Deanne Machado, and she handles kind of all the side of the house that is um, not sworn police officers. That's on Paul's side. But in mine, we have things like you know, dispatch and crime analysis and um, homeless outreach services. And then um, Sandy is just below me. We hired her um, a little, I think about seven, eight months ago, something like that. She's been doing great work and it, it's been able to, to help us kind of increase our effectiveness. And I think the timing of that has been fortuitous given that now we're seeing increased need related to the pandemic. And, and we're also working hard right now, I know, to try to draw up some services for mental health that would ne not necessarily be our staff, but more a contractual staff. So again, I, it, it seems like um, we're really committed to building this integrated model, which I, I really think is the way to go because you need a care continuum for a lot of these issues. Yeah. We are talking, uh, the most recently, the voice you heard was Paul Dorshoff. He is a deputy police chief for Davis. We're also talking with Ryan Collins who is the Outreach Services Coordinator for the City of Davis. I'm Bill Buchanan, and this is Davisville on KDRT. Another change from a year ago is the city has opened the, the day center, the, the respite center, in February, I believe. How is that working from, from each of your perspective, Ryan, and, and then also Paul? Sure. I, I think my perspective is that the, the respite center has been a, a great success. It is on city property uh, near the corner of 5th and L streets. And we work with Communicare Health Centers, um, who's the, the agency that staffs it. They're a local medical provider that serve a lot of people who are of low income. And you know, many of the people that are living in homelessness fall under their existing or potential clientele. And that center is uh, staffed by members of their navigation team, which is part of their kind of behavioral health services side of the house. And the program manager on site is a mental health clinician. So because they're a, a health care organization, I think that they have been very adaptive to providing respite services, day services in the pandemic, whether it's like uh, making sure that people there are property social distancing or have personal protective equipment or again, are getting routed into the right level of care. I, I talk with them almost daily and get a, a lot of referrals to things like Project Room Key, where they're doing some frontline work to assess uh, if someone uh, is in that right level of care. Beyond that, it just gives people a kind of a safe place to be and to um, work on whatever, you know, kinds of issues or problems they have that are preventing them from attending housing and to do that with help from professionals who are kind of aware of the need of creating like a physically and emotionally safe space with you know some resources like internet yeah, food yeah. water showers laundry um, that enable that process is it working I mean are, are is it helping some people get out of homelessness yes I don't know if you have numbers yet I, I know you said earlier you know the next census is, is January for that but uh, I know it's a pilot project and so I imagine there'll be some interest in you know um, knowing how many people uh, come out of the program there and, and feel that that was an essential part of the recovery. Paul any any thoughts on on the respite center? Crime wise I don't have any numbers I, I will probably end up running a statistical analysis on it at some point I haven't heard of anything outrageous though that any major issues that it's caused. The other thing to keep in mind crime wise with with such projects too is uh, homeless folks are often the victims of crime. So they're the victims of robberies, thefts, um, sexual assaults, all those other things. And when you open up projects like that, you also start to build trust within the homeless community. So those crimes actually start to get reported. Sometimes you have to kind of break the stats down and see what is possibly causing 
crime in the area? Is it a is it that type of center, or is it actually that um, there are crimes that are being reported that otherwise would not have because of the services provided? You're bringing things to the surface. I understand your your yeah. point. There. there there was a letter to the Davis Enterprise in April that I I was reading as I researched this. Uh, it's a man who said he lived 150 feet from the entrance and uh, said that as of that time, he'd collected 14 needles used for drugs, tossed yeah. it in my backyard, uh, twice as many along L Street. There's a, there's a church right there. That, uh, in addition, I found six or seven poop smeared blankets and clothing either tossed into my backyard or my front yard during the first weeks after the shelter opened. Obviously, nobody wants that. Um, right. What's the response uh, for him? You know, we would as a police department we would try to manage it the best we can i mean it's you know there was a need for the respite center it had to go somewhere and after a lot of community dialogue that's that was the most likely place i realized that those issues are going to take place and as a police department we'll just we'll just have to manage it the best we can we we won't be able to eliminate it completely so you know that that's essentially we try uh, higher visibility enforcement, probably education within the respite center to make the folks that use it understand better about keeping the area clean. And Well, and, and, and in fact, listening to you now, I was wondering, and, and Ryan, your answer a minute ago, if that's part of building trust with the folks who use the center uh, to say, look, you, you, can't, you can't let this happen. You, you can't let the neighbors have needles in their yard. Yeah, I, I can speak to that a little bit. Two things. Uh, the, the respite center does have, I believe, a person called a safety ambassador on site that acts as something like security guard for the inside of the center as well as someone who does rounds kind of in the surroundings of the center. And, and she's a person that I, I believe is trained with a, a security guard you know, certificate and all of that, but is also a person with lived experience in homelessness. So it is has a good understanding of what some of the issues like people might have in similar kinds of circumstances. And I know that she does a pretty good job, I think, of um, helping to maintain order and encourage, you know, kind of more pro-social behavior or sort of, you know, self-policing rather than generating a call to the police. I do remember that individual case that um, that person was uh, writing the, the letter to the enterprise about. I remember they wrote letters to just about everybody uh, about that, you know, because obviously it's very disturbing and they, they wanted a resolution. And it's funny, uh, that set of problems centered almost entirely around one individual where we had, in addition to the, um, you know, impacts on, on that person's property and neighborhood that he was describing, um, for example, sleeping overnight in the uh, porta potty or, um, you know, uh, grabbed a respite center staff person inappropriately. And this person was very ill, had, had a lot of um, comorbid kind of health conditions going on, couldn't meet their activities of daily living. Even when there were showers and laundry and you know restrooms and things like that there, you're still ending up with poop smeared blankets. So that person did have a higher level of need. And I mean, it's really honestly unfortunate that many of their problems like negatively impacted the quality of life in the community but it acted as sort of a, a red flag that shot up to the system where then we were able to, to ultimately shepherd that person into um, some psychiatric care. I, I think that we had a, a 5150 hold. And I'd be curious if you reached out to that um, same person that issued the complaint of the letter to the editor to say, how's it look for you now? Have you had problems with that same person? Are you encountering it? Because the sad thing is, is that because so much of it goes unreported or unknown, it's really often until you get something really bad that, that occurs that sort of draws attention to the need that then you can bring the appropriate resource in for kind of a, addressing the problem. Yeah, all, all I have done is read the one letter to the, the editor to it, but I, I can imagine this person having been visible will probably be visible again if, if the problem wasn't addressed. And um, Hey, Bill, Bill, I got to yeah. run to this other meeting I have, so I okay. apologize, but uh, hopefully. So, well, well, thank you, Paul, uh, for okay. appearing on the show today. You, you made it for most of it. All right, thank you. Bye-bye. That was Paul Doroshoff signing off, the uh, Deputy Police Chief for Davis. We still have Ryan Collins uh, on for a little bit longer. Ryan, are there things, you've done this job for a few years now in Davis. Are there, is there something you would like people to know about homelessness in Davis that you think that they don't know? It's an interesting question. 
because I, I think that we've tried to do a lot of work in educating the, the public um, about homelessness because people really want answers. They, they want to know why is this individual sort of that I see living in the state that they're in. And they want to know what are you doing sort of to address the problem or what causes it. And we definitely try to put that information out. I guess to the people of Davis, if there's something new that I wanted them to know, it would be that these are unprecedented times that we are living through. And the need is rising from what it has been previously. And we're definitely going to need more permanent housing for people who are going through homelessness to exit homelessness into if we're ever to kind of solve that problem. We're also going to need more emergency shelter during kind of the present surge of need, and we're not currently equipped to do that. So if you want to really take a bite out of homelessness, if you want to see the quality of life improve for the people that are living with it, and you want your own quality of life and kind of comfort to be improved by not having to deal with like the externalized impacts from that, that it's important to support efforts that would increase access to things like shelter and affordable housing. And often the, the arena that this ends up in is political when you're making decisions for things like zoning or siting projects or things like that. I, I remember the, the sort of battle at council or the, the respite center just for providing day services. But um, at the end of the day, while there are some kind of egregiously bad cases that stand out, like the, the person who prompted the letter to the editor at the Enterprise, homelessness really just represents people that aren't able to afford a place to live. They come from all walks of life. They have all sorts of stories, and many of them would make good neighbors. So consider that when you're talking about, well, what can we do to make this better? The, the answer is going to be to try to find places for people to live kind of amongst you rather than shoving the problem aside. That There is no, no place to sort of move people to. They're coming from our communities. They're coming in increasing numbers. And, and we have to find a, a way to kind of quickly reintegrate. Otherwise, we're going to see everything go from bad to worse. Yeah, and, and I, I think to add to that, uh, places where they can live that have the services they need, because the mental health problems and the drug and or addiction problems, by no means for all, but it, it is a real problem, a, a real cause for homelessness. Uh, it, it Absolutely. Is. That, that model of housing is called permanent supportive housing. So permanent housing with supports. It can look like a, a place where people live that has a, an on-site social worker, for example, or it can be kind of a, a distributed model of scattered sites where they have someone who visits and checks in on them, you know, with some frequency to make sure that their needs are being met and that they're not backsliding with an addiction or experiencing a mental health crisis or something else that um, can cause them to lose their housing. Well, Ryan, we'll have to, to leave it there. Thank you for your time today. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Ryan Collins, we've been talking with. He is the Homeless Outreach Services Coordinator for the City of Davis. I am Bill Buchanan on Davisville. We also talk with Paul Doroshoff, and thank you for listening.